Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me today. And I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the issues around nuclear power and uh, what's going on in Fukushima. Uh, before, before I uh, talk about the key issues around Fukushima, I just want to share uh, uh, the moment uh, when I experienced uh, the disaster 10 years ago. I was a university student uh, studying in Tokyo and I felt strong earthquake even in Tokyo. Um, I was in the university building at that time and I saw the wall uh, cracking and I, I quite remember the horrible sound. I don't know where it came from, but it's, it's, like, it's like the land uh, was roaring. And I was living in the dormitory, uh, university dormitory at that time. And the professors came to the dormitory uh, telling the student to wear masks or wash clothes uh, when you came back from outside uh, for protection. And I saw many news um, uh, reporting about the meltdown in, on TV, but I, I couldn't understand it. Um, we never had, I, I never had kind of was related to nuclear power before. And, and that was me 10 years ago. And at the time, um, the people uh, in Fukushima, a few kilometers radius from the uh, power plants were ordered to evacuate and then it was expanded to 20 kilometers and then uh, expanded more. Uh, for your information, uh, Tokyo is uh, 200 kilometers uh, away from Fukushima. But um, I, I will show you the map of the uh, pollution later, but the, the wider area of uh, East uh, Japan were contaminated. Yeah, and 10 years has passed, but the nuclear accident is not over at all. Um, moreover, um, I mean, I, I think some issues got more complex and difficult. And I'm going to talk about uh, four things today. Um, uh, we are worried about especially um, one, even uh, so many people are still suffering from the consequence of the disaster. The government, uh, Japanese government claims that the crisis is over and the reconstruction has been made. And two, the disaster and the nuclear power destroyed communities and families. And now the affected people are economically and socially isolated. And sadly, contaminated water and soil are being stockpiled. And in order to reduce the volume of these waste, the government is considering to use this contaminated soil for co construction work or to release this contaminated water into the ocean. And finally, even those difficulties, um, trillions and are being spent to restart nuclear power plants. I would like to uh, share the word of Mr. Kono, uh, Kono Sumiyo-san. His house was located 10 kilometers away from Fukushima Daiichi, and he evacuated from Namie town. And his, his uh, house was uh, demolished quite recently. And he said, um, the fuko, fuko is the word, uh, a Japanese word meaning uh, recovery or reconstruction. Uh, that is the last thing I want to hear. I don't want to hear words like bonding or recovery. They are not, uh, not words that should be used loosely. Fuko is about things getting back to normal and then standing up and starting again. But this, there's no such thing as fuko when you can't go back to normal and when you cannot rise up again. So um, fuko is the word being used by the government as a slogan uh, for Olympics. Uh, uh, the, it was supposed to happen, the Tokyo Olympics was supposed to happen last year, but um, they use uh, reconstruction uh, or recovery from a nuclear uh, accident is kind of symbol for the Olympics, even though there are so many people are suffering and a lot of unsolved issues are there. And this uh, figure shows the returning rate in the affected area. After 2014, uh, the evacuation orders have been lifted one by one. However, people are not returning. 
and those who returned are mostly elderly people. The percentage shows here is that um, includes the those who relocated to the area uh, for the contamination work, uh, those who are working in the power plants or or new project in this area. So um, the even I uh, I'm showing this uh, figure. Uh, it says like 28% uh, return return, but it doesn't really um, show the reality. Doesn't reflect the reality at all. And the, the contamination is still going on. Uh, it is uh, true that radiation contamination level in the atmosphere is decreasing, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the reality because air dose will easily affected by the weather. And, but when we look at the soil contamination, um, it is still quite high. Um, it's the, the data is uh, collected by Minna no Data Saito. Uh, it's a citizen's initiative. Uh, the citizens are monitoring the contamination. But the government and the municipalities, they only measure air dose. They don't measure uh, soil contamination. So these data are, um, are thanks to the citizens' initiatives. And as I said, the affected people are economically suffering. Uh, the lifting the evacuation order means that the support for victims are also cut. In the first place, affected people don't get enough compensation. But according to the survey uh, done by Tokyo Metropolitan uh, Government, uh, shows that the monthly household income of uh, evacuees living in Tokyo is quite low. And living in Tokyo is quite expensive. So this really shows how severe their life are. And also the uh, figure on right side is Niigata Prefecture study. The employment situation has been changed quite um, quite a bit. Uh, people are not employed or non-regular workers number are increased. And to these um, figures are uh, based on Tokyo government um, uh, survey and also Niigata Prefecture survey. And the Japanese national government does not do this kind of research. So they don't do, um, how to say, they don't even try to grasp the situation of evacuees. The other, uh, the third thing I uh, mentioned uh, was the, this contaminated water issues. The water, uh, the rainwater and the cooling water and groundwater uh, were constantly get contaminated at the site. And TEPCO, uh, Tokyo Electronic Company, uh, treats this um, contaminated water using the machine called ARPUS. And the treated water are in, uh, stored in the tanks and there are already a thousand tanks on, uh, stored at the site. And the government and TEPCO claim that the water only contains tritium and they technically say it is safe to release into the ocean. However, it turned out that the water um, contains more than that. I mean, uh, the TEPCO said that this water only contains tritium, but it turned out that it water contains um, other radioactive materials such as iodine-129 uh, or so, strontium-90 above regulatory level. Um, last year, Greenpeace released a new report. Uh, that report says contaminated water uh, contains dangerous level of carbon-14, and it has the potential to damage human DNA. And um, the, now what the government and TEPCO are saying is that the TEPCO will treat this treated water again, and um, and uh, will reduce the contaminated level um, to the uh, regulatory level, but um, but the but that ALPS cannot uh, remove tritium uh, anyway, and the health effect of tritium is contested. So this is also an issue. And we surveyed the fishing uh, cooperatives, uh, what they are thinking of this idea. And 90% uh, opposed this uh, idea. And not only fishing communities, but also uh, mothers and citizens groups and even neighboring countries are against the ocean discharge. And these 
problems are not solved yet the the cost of accident uh, is is skyrocketing. Uh, the previously the government uh, by themselves estimated uh, 11 trillion yen uh, for the co uh, cost of uh, uh, clean clean up, but the the even the government uh, re uh, revisit that. Uh, figure and now they they are estimate says uh, 21 uh, trillion yen but uh, other uh, for example one uh, private think tank estimated that it it can be uh, 81 trillion yen and this number uh, this money includes uh, for example storage or the contamination work or compensation to the victims but the loss of the people suffering, like loss of time with families or change their life, loss of hometown or loss of livelihood, we cannot compensate that. Uh, we cannot we cannot measure that in numbers simply. So, um, yeah. But even even the cost <laughs> is is like this. And lastly, the 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 situation is far from normal. But but. The government and the nuclear companies are still eager to restart nuclear power plants. And the recently, um, the newspaper counted that after 2011, electric companies spent already uh, 5 trillion yen uh, in total to restart nuclear power. Uh, so after 311, some re safety regulations were changed so that so the companies needed to upgrade, upgrade their facilities. Well, well with with that huge uh, amount of money, we can do so many other things, but they are still wasting money to reach the nuclear power station. So, um, yeah, for uh, the the final remark from me that um, we 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 had big earthquake last month, and if we keep running nuclear power, the nuclear accident may repeat. And if even we, if we don't have earthquake, there's a lot of risks and injustice associated with nuclear power. And the risks and the damage uh, posed onto the local communities and the workers in the uh, nuclear power station and the nuclear waste that goes to future generations. That's, that's quite a great injustice of nuclear power. I was I was so ashamed um, ten years ago because I don't I didn't know anything about nuclear power. I was so ashamed of my ignorance, and that's why I joined FOE and started the uh, uh, involve, in, involvement in the campaign. And ten years after, the situation is still quite severe, but that's that's why we have to keep saying no to this unjust energy and listen to the voice of people affected by the nuclear accident and stand together. And now I would like to screen the, the interview uh, film uh, so that you can listen to the, the voice of pe people in Fukushima. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Sayumi. And yes, we'll go now to the film Miyaruka. And there'll be, we'll have questions after all the speakers. So yeah, feel free to put your questions forward in the chat whenever you feel like it. Sorry, was there no sound? No. Maybe yeah, I'll start again. Start Sorry again. about that. Thank you. 
My that area of Itadi village, where a temporary stretch of contaminated soil still stands out. It is around 43 km from the Tepco Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. We visited Hasegawa Kenichi, local leader at the time of the disaster, together with Muto Reiko, who lives in Miharu town, Fukushima prefecture. Mr. Hasegawa has returned to live in Itate and is now growing soba buckwheat and involved in the agricultural recovery of the area. We asked Mr. Hasegawa what he thinks of the so-called Recovery Olympics. The Olympics are the なくしたい忘れさせたいっていうそういう考えでいいなとあっと進んでるまず国のお金によって箱物がどんどんどんどんできるわけだそれが全国放送ですと放送されるわけだそうとはもうどんどん進んでんだなっていうそういう思いに国
毎日3000万人ですよ。調子えっ、ー、と、小町です。村が。村が。赤手の補填っていうと、みんなに何やってんだって言われるから、調子。にもかかわらず、まだあの後ろに、あのちっちゃな公園だとか、作ろうと今作ってるかな。そこに3000万のブロンズのベンチを置くんだとかって、そういうのわけわかんねえぐらい。大体議員だって、10人いるうち1人だか2人くらいしか持ってないんだから。あとはみんなそこだから。外にいて、これからの家建て村をどうしようだって考えっかっていうことです。すべてのものをやっぱり原発は奪ったから。もうすべてのもの。だって俺だって今だって山にも入れてるわけですよ。子供たちがいてよ。で、子供たちと一緒に、まあ、孫たちと山にも行ってな。そんで山のものを取ったりよ、いろいろ教えたり、それがやって当たり前だったと。まあ、そんなこと何でもできないわけだから。だって子供たちいねえわけだからな。いたとしてもね、そんな山に入れるようにない。そう、生産祭のものも食えにしな。だから今だって、ルイコさんあたりもの裏の裏あたりで多分言われてると思う。まだこんなことやってんのか。俺だって言われたんだから。まだこんなことやってるのか。というのはみんな忘れてんだよ、もう。福島は復興したと思ってんだよ。忘れたいっていうね、思いもあるしね。そう。だからまあオリ,オリンピックでは邪魔なんだから、我々。あの被害者っていう、被災者は。Thanks so much for sharing that.、Um, Ayumi, and did you want to have any closing remarks before we move to the next speaker?、Uh, yeah, thank you so much.、Uh, you can watch the video on our website.、Uh, just、uh, share the link on the, in the chat. And we have more、uh, other videos as well. I, uh, I uh, mentioned the quote from.、Uh, Uh, Mr. Kono in my presentation, and his、uh, interview video is also there. So please watch. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, well,、uh, next up we'll go to Dr. Philip White, and he was the International Liaison Officer for the Tokyo based Citizens Nuclear Information Center at the time of the Fukushima nuclear accident. And in 2014, he completed a PhD on the public participation in Japan's nuclear energy policy forming process. So over to you, Philip. Thank you. Yes, as introduced, my name is Philip White, and I was working in Tokyo for Citizens Nuclear Information Center at the time of the earthquake. Um, I've been asked to talk about the time and also something about my PhD,、um, which, as、um, Michaela said, was about public participation. In、oh, Philip, sorry to interrupt. We're just having a little bit of trouble with your audio.、Um, can you hold the microphone out on, the,、uh, on your earphones?、Uh, my earphone, can you hear me now? Yeah, if, if you, can you find the mic on your earphones and just hold it away from your clothing? How, I'm not using the mic. I'll just unplug and just go straight from the machine. Is that okay? Sure. Can you hear me better now? Yes, sounds good. Okay. Well, I'm going to up the volume for my own purposes.、Um, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just continue as if you've all heard that. Um, so, first, I'd like to convey a few key messages in case I ran out of time. I think I better get them up front.、Um, so, the first message I was going to make was that the nuclear disaster is not over yet. And Ayumi has explained that quite well, so I won't go into any detail about that, but it's a very important point for everybody to remember. 
However much the government wants to forget it or us to forget it, it's not something we should forget. The next point I want to make, and I'll make this more as I go on, is that the Fukushima nuclear accident was by no means the worst case scenario. I'll explain a little bit about how much worse it might have been. And uh, the chaos of the situation at the time and the lack of preparation for such an event meant that absolutely anything could have happened. It was pure luck that it was not much, much worse. I'd also like to mention something about Citizens Nuclear Information Centre's role in providing real-time alternative critical information at the time. And uh, I'll also just mention, if there's time at the end, how surprisingly public participation introduced after the accident had genuine, albeit short-lived, influence in the nuclear policy making process. Um, unfortunately, that didn't persist, but it was there for a while. So first I'll just explain a little bit about my circumstances when I was when the earthquake happened. It happened at 2 246 p.m. on Friday the 11th of March 2011 and at the time I was in the diet offices. Diet is not something that you drink or anything like that. Diet is the Japanese parliament. I was in the offices of the uh, of national politicians um, doing some lobbying work. I was on the second basement and this massive earthquake came. Now, of course, this is several hundred kilometers away from the center. We didn't know where the epicenter was at the time. And it was the biggest shake by far that I'd ever experienced, even though I'd experienced quite a few smaller earthquakes in Japan. Um, once the earthquake uh, subsided, I went up to the office of uh, Abe Tomoko, who's a diet member um, from the Social Democratic Party, um, her, we were using her office as a base for that uh, lobbying activity. And as I went there, I saw on the TV screen that they had there how tsunamis were inundating the Tohoku area, Tohoku being the northeast of Japan. And I can't remember really clearly, but I think that uh, her secretary, uh, Morihara Hideki at the time, told me that at that stage, the nuclear power plants were reported to have shut down safely. Um, actually, I found out later that um, the first, at, after the first report was that the reactor scram, scram being automatic shutdown in an emergency, the act, reactor scram had operated safely. But that's before the tsunami hit and backup diesel generators were lost, so that there was complete power blackout at the site, at the plant. But at that stage, all I was hearing was reassurances that it was going to be okay. And so I set out on the long journey home. So I was in the middle of Tokyo and I had to walk about 17 kilometers. It took me about five hours uh, walking alongside thousands upon thousands of other people who were also stranded um, by the power outage and the fact that the trains were not running. So this was the experience of that first night when I get, got home, um, I think from memory, my wife said that at this stage, she hadn't heard any reports that the nuclear power plants were in danger. So I went to bed feeling, okay, well, I'll go back to work tomorrow as usual. Um, and that's not exactly how it turned out. The following morning, I woke up bright and early and my wife was telling me, oh, there's problems at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. This is before any explosions, but they were the fact that problems had arisen was on the radar. And from shortly after that, my phone started ringing and it hardly stopped ringing from the international media um, for the next month. I averaged about four hours sleep for every day for the next month. Sometimes it was less. Okay, so that's just my a brief account of my experience. Um, let me just go through a little bit more detail about what actually happened on the, on the day of the earthquake itself. So as I said, the uh, earthquake hit at 2.36, I think it was, in, in the afternoon. And the first tsunami wave came in um, about half past three, and that was only about four metres high. So the plant coped with that okay. 
But about, oh, about eight minutes later, the second wave came and that was over 15 meters high and it breached all the barriers that they had in place. And a couple of minutes later, um, from due to the flooding, backup diesel generators had been knocked out. And of course the offsite power was already out because of the earthquake. And with the backup generators out, that means that the uh, unit one um, at least had lost all power and the control room for units one and two. So there were six, plant, there were six reactors on the site um, and one, two and three were operating at the time of the earthquake, four, five and six were not operating. Five and six were a little bit further away. So one, two, three and four were all bunched in together. And units one and two were all controlled from the same control room and that control room had gone dark. So you can imagine trying to control nuclear power plants in the dark. That's how it started anyway. About 6 p.m. on that day, so a couple of workers went up to the fourth floor and discovered that there were radiation readings off the scale. So clearly something was happening to the the, fuel, the, the nuclear fuel in the in the reactor. Um, at uh, just after 7 p.m., the prime minister of the time, uh, Naoto Khan, declared a nuclear emergency. But I didn't know any of this. I was walking home. I was in the dark. Um, walking somewhere between the center of Tokyo and my home. And that, that information didn't get to me till the following morning, as I said. So let me now go into a little bit about the evacuation. So, as I said, an, an emergency was declared at just after seven, but at uh, about 9 p.m., uh, evacuation was ordered. This was all ordered in a circle of three kilometers around the nuclear power plant. Um, but that three kilometres was subsequently realised to be not enough. They had actually planned for five kilometres in the event of an emergency. Um, so the first three kilometres was within that range. But immediately 6am the following morning on the 12th, that Saturday morning, they'd expanded it to 10 kilometres already. And that's before any of the plants had exploded. So the first one, Unit 1, explodes at 3.36pm and the evacuation is extended to 20 kilometres in a concentric circle around that plant at about uh, half past six in the, in the evening. And that's where it stayed, basically for quite a long time, a 20 kilometres concentric circle, regardless of how the radiation was spreading. If you were within that circle, you got, you, you got out. If you were between 20 and 30 kilometres, if I remember, you were told to stay indoors. But where the radiation was actually going, nobody knew. The evacuation itself was chaotic. You just imagine, you've just been hit by an earthquake. Roads have been, roads have been damaged. Everybody's trying to get out all at once. Traffic congestion. The Futaba Hospital, Futaba is one of the towns in which this Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located. 4.5 4 kilometers away from the reactor, the Futaba Hospital, had to be evacuated. Now the hospital had a whole lot of people in there, old people, sick people, some on emergency support, they've lost power and they're in a radiation zone. 50 people died out of that from that hospital because of the because of the earthquake and also because of the fact that the radiation was there and they had to be evacuated. Um, now there was actually a system that they had set up and it was for, for predicting how the radiation would spread. This was called SPEEDY for short, System for Prediction of Environment Emergency Dose Information, SPEEDY. They never used it. It was predicting that uh, how the radiation would spread. Had they used it, they probably would have um, been able to get a, a better picture of where they should evacuate people from. But this was um, considered to be not real, not real information, it's just uh, modeling. So they decide not to use it. Well, whether that was a good decision or not, uh, I'm not necessarily one to judge, but I can say that um, as it turned out, the radiation did not spread in concentric, concentric circles. It spread particularly to the Northwest 
and you heard reference to Itate village, which is where that the gentleman in that video was from. Um, I think he was anyway, Itate village, northwest about 30, between 30, 40 kilometers away. Um, but that place was not evacuated at the time, even though that's where a large concentration of the radiation was going. Okay, <clears throat> so we go back to the explosions themselves and the situation in the power plant. So as I said, 3.36 p.m. on the, the day after the earthquake, the first reactor explodes. Shock, horror. What do we do now? What has happened? What caused it? How much radi radiation is, is out there? How many more plants are going to blow up? Nobody knew the answer to these questions, but it was going through everybody's mind. So the fight to prevent more explosions and more melt meltdowns was as you can imagine, chaotic. The people in the plant had not been prepared for this sort of thing. They'd never imagined this sort of thing could happen. <clears throat> Communication between the nuclear power station itself and TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company's management and the government was confused and often it was garbled. The big fight was to find cooling water for the reactors get water there and release the pressure that was building up inside the reactors from the fuel as it was melting down. But how are you gonna get water there? You've got no pumps, no electricity. The question arose, should we use seawater or should we use fresh water? If you use seawater, the moment they pumped seawater in there, the plants were going to be a write-off regardless of whether there was any damage in, internally before that, seawater would corrode it, they'd never be able to dream of using those plants again. That actually was a consideration. There you have, you have a crisis, you have all sorts of potential terrible things happening, but there are people there who say, oh, no, 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 we can't put seawater in there. Let's go and find fresh water. But they didn't have fresh water, not enough of it anyway. But where are they going to get the seawater from anyway? How are they going to pump it up? They actually found they were, they were trying to pump up using fire trucks, uh, pumping up um, water that had rushed in with the tsunami from pools that had collected there. Nothing prepared, it's not in the manual, but this is what they were doing, improvising. And they were trying to, un to release the pressure valves, pressure valves which required electricity to release, they were trying to release them manually. So suicide squad workers would go in, they'd get significant doses, they really thought this was probably the end for them. Not just the suicide squad, but everybody there on site, they thought that they were, their, their number was up. Now, there was actually a limit to how much dose they were allowed to take, but they were exceeding that already. And they actually lift, lifted the limit just to allow them to keep working. And just imagine they're doing this and at the same time, there's repeated aftershocks happening. And then there's all this radioactive rubble around the place from the explosions. So it was seriously considered, should we withdraw all the workers, just abandon the plants? This was seriously considered. And thanks to 50 odd people, workers, call them heroes who stayed behind, we got some, le some level of control, but by no means did it, could you say that the situation was controlled. Okay, now I'm working for Citizens Nuclear Information Centre. I'm fielding inquiries from the media and uh, my organisation is responding as best as it can. <clears throat> Our organisation prides itself as giving a scientifically critical perspective on nuclear power. We had links with scientists and technologists from outside of our organisation, particularly those who'd been set up as a scientists and technologists group after the after a previous earthquake that had occurred in 2007 on the other side. And we had people who were actually experienced engineers who had worked on these nuclear power plants. And that we, we set up Ustream. I don't know whether you're familiar with Ustream, but uh, an online video comment uh, system and provided live commentary to people, giving critical information, thinking, giving an analysis of what was actually happening because the information that was coming from the government and from TEPCO was severely limited and people were very unsatisfied with it. In fact, 
the government blocked information pr pr prior to the explosion of the third nuclear power plant. And uh, so our, our, our experts were giving, giving information. Had it melted down? Had it melted through? Should they use seawater? What was the cause of it? Was it the earthquake or was it the tsunami had caused it? And what was the risk of radiation? This is an information that people really wanted. And so a lot of people tuned into us. My role was really just to point the media to what CNIC was doing on Ustream. However, if they couldn't deal with the Japanese language, um, I would try to give them some sort of information based on the information I was getting. Um, or I'd point them to uh, previous background information that was on our website. And at the very least, I aim to make them aware that there was this critical perspective that was being given and that there were alternative views from what the government was offering. Okay, so then a few days later, we have the hydrogen, ex hydrogen explosion at the third unit three. And then another day later on the 15th, four days after the uh, <coughs> earthquake, a large amount of radioactivity was released from the second unit. And then at about the same time, there was a hydrogen, hydrogen explosion in the fourth unit, the fourth unit, which wasn't operating at the time. But what that did was it exposed the spent fuel pool. Now, the spent fuel pool is the fuel that has been accumulating in that uh, nuclear power plant ever since it had started operating. So there were many, many times more radioactivity in that spent fuel pool than had already gone up in the other reactors combined. And so international attention, not just Japanese attention, turned to this spent fuel pool. And this is where I'm gonna start saying how bad it could have got. So the United States actually was saying, look, that has evaporated. That fuel pool must have evaporated. There's no roof on it. How can it not have evaporated? And the US Embassy in Japan on March the 17th advised American citizens living within 80 kilometers of the Fukushima nuclear power plant to evacuate the area. So that was four times the distance that the Japanese government evacuation order had been given. And so there are a lot of people within Japan who were, call who were calling for an expansion of the ev evacuation zone, but actually that didn't happen. There was no expansion except Another month or so later, finally, 42 days after the earthquake, the evacuation zone was extended to include Itate off to the northwest, over 30 kilometers away. And I don't believe that they began evacuating till mid-May. So all those people in Itate had been exposed for that long. Now, it could have been much worse. It really, it's amazing that it wasn't. I talked about that Fukushima number four, power plant um, spent fuel pool. The only reason why that water didn't evaporate off was because they'd been doing some maintenance work. And just during the maintenance period, there was a whole lot of water that was in the reactor well, which was could potentially flow into the spent fuel pool. But normally, in normal circumstances, that water wouldn't have been there. Now that maintenance work was due to be finished uh, four days before the earthquake. However, the maintenance was delayed. So that water was still there. And instead of all the water being evaporated off, as it evaporated off, it was able to trickle in from this um, a reactor well. So that's just a miracle, really. And had that happened, the Japan Atomic Energy Commission's chairman was asked to do a review as to how much, how far you, you'd have to evacuate. And the conclusion he came to was that you'd have to evacuate an area with a radius of 170 kilometers, or even as much as 250 kilometers, which would have ended up including Tokyo. So there was genuine thought that they might have to evacuate Tokyo. The Tokyo wider, greater area is about 30 million or so people. That didn't happen, but it's a miracle that it didn't. Well, there's many other nuclear power plants in Japan, and quite a few of them are up that eastern coast. What happened to them? We'll just mention another miracle. Tokai 2, which is about 100 kilometers south, uh, west, south of Fukushima, 
the, the tsunami didn't breach that wall. But the only reason why it didn't was just two days earlier, they completed work to um, raise that tsunami wall a few feet and it was able to hold out the tsunami. But had that work not been completed just two days earlier, there was another reactor that would have, would have gone up. Now, another mir miraculous thing was that the wind blew most of the radioactivity out to sea. So even though you have highly contaminated area, actually, it would have been much, much more contaminated if the wind had been blowing in a different direction. OK, look, that's enough of just trying to give you a sense of what it was like at the time. My PhD was more about the, on the policy line. I'll just quickly mention that uh, a policy review was begun in September the 2011 under the government of the Democratic Party of Japan, which is a somewhat more progressive party than had been in power for, for 50 years before that. And they actually set up a panel to review the policy and it had quite a few more nuclear critics on the panel than had ever been there before. There was serious debate, unlike the pro forma de debate that had always happened in the past. And they included public opinion in a much fuller way. There was a thing called a deliberate poll held in August 2012. Now that's comparable to um, the citizen's jury. You might remember a citizen's jury was held um, in association with the South Australian Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission. The deliberative poll is a similar sort of thing. And guess what? There was a similar result. The citizen's jury in South Australia rejected nuclear power and everything else. And the deliberative poll in Japan came up with the result that they wanted to get out of nuclear power. Now, the government, even though it was somewhat more progressive, they were divided. They weren't about to just give up nuclear power. But because of the public opinion, and they took into account public opinion polls generally as well, they came up with a compromise where they said that there'd be a nuclear phase out by the 2030s. And that was interpreted as meaning by 2039. It was a compromise. It was pretty weak, weak really. But for the first time ever, a government had committed to a nuclear phase out. Unfortunately, that government was voted out of power, not because of that policy, but because of all their other failings in December of that year. And the party that came back was the Liberal Democratic Party, who had been the party that had supported nuclear power forever. They gave, did away with public participation. There's minimal public participation. They don't take any notice of it anyway. And they've committed to nuclear energy of 20 to 20% of the energy mix, which I presume means their electricity mix, 20 to 22% going to 2030. And they have no intention of phasing it out. They say they want to minimise it, but they're committed to restarting nuclear power plants. So that's a big step backwards. But in fact, they've had great trouble restarting nuclear power plants. And of the 54 that were operating um, at the time of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, at the moment, there are just four operating. There have been nine that have restarted. Um, but even then, uh, most, many of those have been shut down for various reasons. Okay, so that's all I've got to say. Um, I've probably gone over time anyway, um, but I hope for that. Hopefully, get, that gives you a bit of a sense of what it was like and how really they were lucky that they didn't get much worse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. And uh, yeah, Jim has shared the link to one of Philip's recent articles in the chat. So again. Um, yeah, some great links to follow up. Uh, next up, we've got Kirsten Blair, and she's a media officer with the Gunjaitney Aboriginal Corporation, which represents the rights of the Mira people. And the Mira are the traditional owners of parts of Kakadu National Park, the Ranger and Jabaluka uranium deposits, and parts of, parts of Western Arnhem Land in Australia's Northern Territory. And Friends of the Earth has a long history of working with the MIRA, and currently we collaborate with them through the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance. So over to you, Kirsten. Thanks, Michaela, and hi, everybody. 
Uh, thank you so much to Philip and Ayumi for sharing their personal stories. It's incredible to hear the uh, on-the-ground experience of people who were there in uh, in Japan when that extraordinary event happened. I was here in, in Melbourne. Um, so as Michaela mentioned, yeah, my name's Kirsten Blair and I work for Gunjait Me Aboriginal Corporation, which is based in Jabiru on Mirar country, but I um, am now based on, in Wurundjeri country in Melbourne. So I'm coming to you from there. Um, and I, I am really interested also, I just wanted to reference the coincidences that Philip referenced there because um, there are some other extraordinary coincidences with relation to the Mirar's experience with this story as well, which I'll come to. But really, I think it's very clear to all of us that this was an extraordinary event in the history of the planet for so many reasons. Uh, so I am, we'll just, I uh, won't speak for too long. I wanted to give people, I'm not sure how much of the background people have. So I'll just do a pretty um, surface level overview, I guess, and we can go into more detail later on if we've got time. But uh, the Mirar are traditional owners, as Michaela said, of uh, parts of Kakadu and West Arnhem Land. And the Mirar are the people for, for whom history came knocking in a very loud way. A lot of things have happened on Mirar country and particularly with relation to nuclear issues because on Mirar country are two very significant uranium deposits. So Ranger and Jabaluka, I'm sure people have heard of each of those. The Ranger uranium mine was imposed on the Mirar uh, over 40 years ago. And just at the start of this year on the 9th of January was the first day where Ranger Uranium Mine is no longer operating as a mine. So we have come to the end of the uranium mining period in the Kakadu region, which is incredibly significant. Something I could happily talk for longer than 15 minutes about. Uh, but just to note that, um, that 40 years ago, the government and industry were very confident that that was the beginning of what would be a very long lived period of the uranium mining province of what they called the Alligator Rivers region. And in fact, there's been one mine on that site and that uh, has lasted for four decades, which is certainly not nothing. A lot of yellow cake has been shipped out from that spot. And uh, we've seen really significant impacts from that, not le least the fact that uranium from Mira country was present at Fukushima. So before I talk a little bit more about uh, the Mirage response to and relationship with that disaster, I just wanted to lay out uh, some of the history bet that exists because the Mirage Mira country and Japan actually have a relationship that goes back uh, to well before this accident. And um, in terms of the uh, re relationship with relation to uranium, it begins really actually in the 1970s. And so um, in 1974, uh, Gough Whitlam was, as people would be aware, was prime minister at that time. And he made an agreement with the then prime minister of Japan, Tanaka, and said that uranium from Mira country would supply the nuclear reactors in Japan to provide electricity. So that was in 1974, which is four years, I'm, People, some people will be aware of this history, but it was four years before the agreement was signed with the traditional owners on country up in Kakadu. So, or what was not yet then Kakadu, was um, Mirar country. So, in fact, the federal government's impetus to develop the Ranger mine was to sell uranium to Japan. And there's footage and documentation of the meetings in which Aboriginal people who were living either in a very traditional way or certainly in quite rudimentary housing, there was very minimal federal or um, Northern Territory money available for people's housing at that time. So people were often living without electricity, but they were being told and implored to support this uranium mine because people in Japan need electricity and that the source for that needs to come from your country. So there's always been these references to Japan with relation to uranium mining as far as the Mirage experience has been. So quite extraordinary. And there's, um, as I said, yeah, various documentation of that. And another aspect of that process when the um, when what I called the ranger negotiations, but in fact was the process of the mine being imposed on the mirror and their opposition being ignored and actually legislated against, uh, through that process, 
again, there was, I've just got a little clip that I'm going to share with you now because um, I just find it extraordinarily powerful. So um, Yvonne Margarula, who's the senior traditional owner of the Mirar, uh, currently her father was the senior traditional owner at the time of these negotiations. And we're very fortunate because there were some wonderful, um, sorry, I was trying to get this right. There were some wonderful documentary makers who spent a lot of time up on Mirar country through this period and have documented all kinds of aspects of it, including this wonderful footage, which I hope you can see. Is that showing up? You can see my screen. I need to just make it work better than that. Surely we can do better than that. Can you hear it? it hasn't actually stopped. So this is Toby Gungala. We got the sacred place up there. That's where we didn't like it. I'll just introduce it slightly more. Um, that's Toby Gungale, and he is speaking about one of the reasons why he didn't he doesn't want the mine to happen. This is a sacred site called Jibbi Jibbi, which is King Brown dreaming, and this actually overlooks what eventually became the Ranger Uranium Mine. And he, what he just said was, "We've got a sacred place up there. That's why we don't like this." My father used to tell me, you know, very sacred place up there. You know, we got a bit of snake dream in there. Uh, King Brown. Hey, you can see the painting up there. You know, called very old, nearly a thousand years ago, but they nearly worn out. You know. uh, that's why we don't, we don't let anybody go in up there. Snake might come up and then they, you know, He's a big grand, or oh, what do you call it? <laughs> Sorry, you know, he might go all over, he might kill all, you know, all over the world. To see all the Aboriginal me, you know, reckon, everyone. Not not me, but everyone, you know, from down, fairly, all over the place. But he did have that story, you know, if something go wrong with, you now well, if mine going to go ahead, well, if you might get a big rain or something, cyclone or something. So I hope it's, I know it's a bit hard to hear some of that, uh, some of those quotes, but hopefully you understood most of that. But really what uh, Toby says there is that's a really important place. And what we've always said is if that's disturbed, something bad might happen. And Yvonne, this is the truth, on the 10th of March, 2011 had a conversation with one of my colleagues and it's actually recorded um, in which they spoke about that. They spoke about Toby talking about that and talking about the sacred power. The word for that is Jung. And she spoke a lot about the Jung and how powerful that is and how concerned she was about the fact that uranium from Mirar country was being shipped all over the world and Mirar don't have any control over what happens to it, but they still feel a strong sense of responsibility for any impact that it might have. And the next morning, everybody woke up and found out what had happened in Japan. So in terms of those coincidences that uh, Philip was referencing, there's another really powerful one there. That's a conversation that it's not the first time Yvonne's had that conversation, but it was a really detailed and documented example of that conversation. So um, people were really conscious that this worry and concern that people had had from the outset was still real. And so... That's one of the reasons why um, Yvonne wrote a letter to the then Secretary General of the UN expressing her concern and sense of responsibility for the impacts that that disaster ha was having on the people in Japan. And it was the letter was written before it was confirmed through Senate estimates uh, that it was Australian uranium in each of those reactors. But... Yvonne was aware that there'd been uranium from Mira country travelling to Japan for, for such a long time. The likelihood was really high. So uh, that letter was sent. There was a strong response to that from governments internationally. It's been translated into, I think, 15 languages. A lot. There's been a lot of interest and response to it, and there still is. And um, so the follow in 12 months' time – oh, sorry, that's – before that happened, I've just got a little time frame here. Oh yes, I was so happy to see um, Mr. Hasegawa in 
Ayumi's clip because he also came to Mirror Country and um, we've just got I've just got one picture here of Mr Hasegawa meeting with Yvonne and also Mr Hasegawa's wife and some people would know um, Akira and also Tomo who are in this picture so that um, that was in 2011 uh, just not very long after the event actually and so that was a really extraordinary and powerful moment the first uh, person who'd come from the Fukushima area to Mira country so Yvonne was able to express her sadness and regret that that had happened to their country and it was really powerful and actually everyone was mostly crying and that's why there's only one photo um, but um, so subsequent to that I just want to share this and again some people will have seen this but it's it's just a couple of minutes um, of audio and video of Yvonne uh, speaking about the um, Mira response to the disaster and so again just um, something which was shared widely. <laughs> for mining. Wan bari jal gap jirka ni mungoi. Nunga marak bajar ni wirin. Wan bolki me bu wan ngaya wat nan. Kun red ngaduk. Kun red ad pere na mira. Wan ngat ngari wat nan. Wan mungoi kan di jal gap jirka nat manuali na mira. Kan bol karung. ว่าบริจาคเรียกจะบริโภคว่าบริการุงจ้างมากระยองกุมเมกเกอร์ว่าบริจาคว่าเรื่องบุกรอกว่าบริบอกดุกอย่างบริจาคว่าเรื่องไ
that that reactor really changed his sense of and relationship with the idea of nuclear power. And obviously it's outrageous that something as significant as that has to happen before people have those realisations. But the fact that he was willing to make that public statement was obviously really powerful. And here he is watching that clip that we watched before and um, learning that story about the the concern about the jung that was expressed well before any soil was turned at the ranger's site. And he then went up in a plane and flew over the site and saw the place where the uranium had come from that had that huge impact from Mirar country to his country. So extraordinary. And again, just moments where the power was so palpable and the, the connection was felt really strongly. So I have, obviously that is incredibly light touch on that content and there's heaps more to cover. I'm going to just for less than one minute to talk very briefly about what's going on in Mirror Country now because it's obviously relevant and significant. As I mentioned before, Ranger Mine has stopped producing yellow cake and the rehabilitation process is underway, which is obviously enormous. It's an open cut uranium mining pit in a wet, tropic, wet dry tropical environment. The rehabilitation task is enormous and unknown. So that is something which Mira and Gandatmi are focusing on very strongly to ensure that no corners are cut and that that process is done as comprehensively as possible. At the same time, the rehabilitation of the cultural and social context is underway and the Mira are stepping up to lead that process and have identified a series of objectives that they're working towards for the region beyond mining. So I just wanna show you this beautiful celebratory picture of Yvonne and her sisters and some of the other senior Mira women on the day that the native title handback of Jabiru happened. So that was a really significant step along that way. And here are some pictures of the wonderful Murrawoodi Gallery, which this building here, if anyone's been to Jabiru, this used to be the bakery in Jabiru. And so it used to be where the miners would come after work and get a pie. And that closed, that business closed when it was clear that the mine wasn't going to continue and it's been an empty building for a couple of years. Perfect place for an art centre. And so it's now become the art centre and it is stunning, stunningly beautiful. It's been fitted out absolutely gorgeously. You can see this mural, which has been painted by local artists. And there's incredible works like this amazing marabou. And it is really symbolising the transition that the town is undergoing from a mining service town to a cultural centre and community hub for people who live locally as well as in, uh, the tourists to experience and really see that there's so much more to the region than somewhere to export uranium from, which the Mirror have always known. They've outlived this mining window, which really in the context of the 65,000 years that Mirror have lived on this country is a blink of an eye, 40 years. They've seen it off. They're in the process of seeing off the last of it and they're showing the world that they will take it in the direction that they want to see it go in. That's all. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And yeah, thank you so much to all the speakers for sharing this time with us this evening. Ayumi, Philip and Kirsten have all brought really different perspectives on these issues from uranium mining on Mirror land to nuclear power in Japan, waste and the ongoing struggle for a nuclear free world. And obviously lots of, of work to be done and important information to get out there. Um, and yeah, some great positive news as well that we ended on um, there with Kirsten and the story of, of mining coming to an end on Mirror country. Uh, we've got some time for some questions now. Um, and so a question now for you, Ayumi. Uh, how can we support Friends of the Earth Japan and their work on Fukushima? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, well, uh, we, uh, in terms of uh, anti-nuclear campaign, uh, for us, we uh, created a website. So if you can share it and spread the word, uh, that would be great. And as I said, there are many uh, students' initiatives in Japan to, to monitor the situation and helping 
helping the pe affected people and if you can uh if you can maybe uh financially uh supporting these small initiatives be great and um and um and some affected people um, uh, want to share their stories uh, directly. Uh, even it, uh, unfortunately now the COVID uh, doesn't allow us to travel internationally, but if we can make more uh, space, safe space for those who are affected and want to share the experience, that would be great. And uh, this one is great um, and, and it's great. And um, many, uh, local people don't speak English, but if you can provide translation and and then uh, they can also speak. So yeah, that's that one idea. Great, thank you. And um, are there are many other organizations that you're working with uh, on this issue? Yeah. Um, uh, Philip's uh, organization, uh, Citizens uh, Cynic, Cynic uh, we also work with them and Peaceful, uh, we work quite a lot. And we um, we do actually uh, running our own uh, refreshment uh, camp program for uh, families who are affected in Fukushima. And uh, because of the radiation, uh, students cannot uh, play outside freely. So we uh, organize camps in the area uh, with uh, less uh, contamination and uh, and we um, uh, we have support from uh, cooperatives in western part of Japan and they provide food uh, safe food for these families and there are small that kind of organization around the Japan uh, providing that kind of refreshment uh, program unfortunately this one is also difficult because of the COVID but uh, many families are still needing that kind of opportunity and and also measuring uh, effort a lot of students groups are measuring the radiation contamination one example i showed during my presentation was minna no data site they are doing the quite uh, great work but uh they are doing that on their own budget there's no support for the government and i think government should do the measurement but uh, you know yeah Great. And uh, now we've got a question for Philip. Uh, could you talk a little bit about Japan's nuclear reprocessing plant, Rokasho, and the Manju fast breeder reactor? Yeah, well, this could, I could go on for the rest of the session, but I'll try to keep it brief. For those of you who don't know what reprocessing means in this context, the fuel that goes into the reactor and is then is used and becomes spent fuel, that's actually accumulated plutonium and other things. And the plutonium theoretically can be used to run a nuclear reactor. So the idea is to not just throw away the spent fuel, but use it as a resource. And the J Japanese government has had this policy ever since it started its nuclear program. Um, and, but they've had massive trouble actually making it work and so they've got a reprocessing plant up in the north, the northeast of uh, the main island of Honshu called Rock Gushal Reprocessing Plant. Um, it's about, I don't know, I can't exactly remember the dates, but about 20 years over late due to all sorts of mishaps along the way. It's way over budget and it's been delayed about 23 or four times by now. Um, and uh, the idea is that they will get this uh, plutonium based fuel working in reactors. They've got a little bit working in a few reactors, but hardly anything. And in the process, they've managed to accumulate 40 plus tons of plutonium. This is much of it's held overseas, but some of it's held in Japan. And so this is considered a nuclear weapons risk. And so there's criticism not only from people like me and my organizations and AUMI's organizations, but also from, the, from people within the United States, for example, and other countries that are concerned that Japan is stockpiling all this plutonium with no real prospect of using it. Now, the Monju uh, 
fast breeder reactor was supposed to be a good place for using it. But that, is, that also has had massive mishaps and has actually, the, the government has finally abandoned the Monju fast breeder reactor. They haven't abandoned fast breeding altogether, but they've abandoned Monju. So in other words, this plutonium really can't be, it can be used in ordinary reactors, but very slowly. And so there's this feeling that if they do start it up, which they sort of planning to do, I think uh, next year or the year after or something like that, um, then it'll just add more plutonium to the stockpile. Um, however, based on past record and their inability to make it work, there's every chance that even if they do start it up, it'll have a problem of its own straight away. Um, but anyway, it's another case of Japan, just the Japanese government just refusing stubbornly to give up on a failed policy. It is an utterly failed policy, but they stick to it. Um, yeah, that's a brief summary of the situation now. Oh, thank you so much. And Ayumi, did you want to add anything um, about Rokashu or, or the Manju reactor? Uh, I don't have anything to add, but I was just wondering. Um, I, I can I ask Philip a question? <laughs> okay. So uh, I am often asked by friends outside Japan why, um, why even after the nuclear accident, why Japan still keep nuclear power and this this much kind of uh, uh, program. And uh, uh, and how? Because because um, I mean, uh, um, how how do you see that, uh, Philip? Uh, why <laughs> it's maybe it's weird to ask you, but I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, I, I don't know, but you know better than I know that there's a thing uh, that they refer to a thing called the nuclear village, and the nuclear village is these. Um, people who have vested interest in nuclear power, academics, government people, power, new, power companies, uh, power building companies like Mitsubishi and Toshiba and Hitachi. And they have, apart from having tunnel vision that they only see their own perspective, they also have these deep vested interests. Uh, there's another thing, I mean, policy inertia, the, to, to, to actually admit failure seems to be something that they find very, very difficult. Um, you know, and the TEPCO and company or other, they also sponsor politicians, uh, sometimes openly, sometimes less openly. So it all, all becomes this convoluted um, web of connections. Um, and public opinion isn't really taken very seriously, but when it is, it's local level public opinion. And the people, the local governments often actually, much as they realize it's a failure, they don't want to give it up because this is the goose that go laid the golden egg. This is where the money comes from. They get lots and lots of money from power companies and whoever else um, uh, to their local municipality. So anyway, I mean, policy inertia, what creates it, I don't know, but they're some of the factors. Thank you, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Great, well, um, yeah, people have been sharing some more great links in the chat. So um, yeah, please jump on there and, and pull out some of those if you have more questions. Um, yeah, did, if any of the speakers, did you have any final remarks or questions for each other? Oh, good. All right. Well, thank you all so very much for joining us this evening. Could I just, sorry, Michaela, actually, um, I just wanted to mention the um, event that I'm not sure if it's only Peaceboat who's organising it, but I've seen, I've been sent various Bits of information, maybe you're going to talk about it, about the conference that's on Thursday. Are you, are you talking about that? No, tell us. No, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm having a coughing attack at the same time. 
Uh, there's a global conference for a nuclear-free renewable energy future, 10 years since Fukushima. So it looks like there's lots of organisations involved, but the um, but Peace Boat uh, were the people who shared it with me. So I'm just putting the link to that in the chat right now. So it's all day on Thursday, but there's like 75 different events. So check it out. I'm sure there will be something of interest. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I hope everybody's inspired to um, yeah, keep working on these issues, supporting the campaigns, Philip. Just one thing to Ayumi and also me, you just reminded me. Um, unfortunately, I can't participate in any of those things because of work. But uh, just Ayumi, tell people that I appreciate that they're doing all those uh, conferences and meetings and uh, following up on the Fukushima um, 10th anniversary over in Japan. I only wish I could be involved. Yeah, sure, I will tell that. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you to everybody who joined uh, this evening and the ACE Nuclear Free Collective at Friends of the Earth. We really welcome new collective members. Um, yeah, so if you're based in Melbourne or at the moment, our meetings are both in person and online. So yeah, you're welcome to join from from other places as well. We meet fortnightly on Wednesday evening. So next Wednesday is our next meeting. And you can also support our work by becoming an active friend or join our email list to, to stay in touch and hear about other events uh, such as these. Yeah, Thank Nick, you, you Michaela. Questions? Beautiful hosting, Michaela. Thank you. And Thank Jim you so shared, yeah, all those links there. So, yeah, thanks again, everybody. And let's keep all working together for a nuclear-free future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>